today's class on advanced characterization technique, we are going to talk about a new characterization technique known as grazing incidence small angle x-ray scattering. In the last class, we had studied small angle x-ray scattering and we uh, understood that how small angle scattering can help us about the distribution of sizes as well as shape of different uh, particles and precipitates in a variety of materials. We also know that with the improve, uh, improve, uh, increase in nano, uh, uh, research going on in nanotechnology, there is a lot of uh, need for a characterization technique that can be used to characterize small uh, scale uh, sizes and shapes on the surface. right? And for that, we need to use uh, a technique which is essentially known as grazing incidence small angle x-ray scattering. Now if you remember, we had talked about grazing incidence uh, while we talked about the, uh, normal X-ray diffraction. So we can have either a normal incidence wherein the X-ray beam is incident on your sample in a reflection or in the transmission mode. While in case of grazing incidence, the beam is almost parallel and makes a very, very small angle with the sample under consideration. The most important point uh, that I would like to emphasize uh, here onwards and that's why I'm sticking on this particular slide is that what all techniques we are going to talk uh, from here on in the course of this lecture uh, is that uh, are pretty sophisticated techniques and these are not the techniques which uh, essentially are available uh, you know in laboratory and like you just pick up pick up your sample and uh, take your sample over there uh, to do the characterization instead these are very sophisticated techniques and it is expected that you understand uh, these techniques and get exposure to these techniques and then carry out your preliminary uh, characterization using uh, you know, uh, laboratory scale X-ray diffraction and other characterization tools. And then you go to this advanced characterization techniques in order to solve your problem of uh, importance. So let us start talking about grazing uh, incidence, small angle scattering in the present class. So as I had already mentioned, grazing incidence, small angle X-ray scattering is a variant of small angle X-ray scattering, but it is used extensively for carrying out characterization on the surface. It, has, it was developed by Levin et al. in 1989. So you can realize that this technique is not something that is pretty old. In fact, there, there have been less than 15 years this technique has evolved. However, the development in this technique has been tremendous in the last 15 odd years and this technique is used extensively in almost all synchrotron sources uh, all over the world because it is essentially applicable to study polymer films, nanoparticles at interfaces, implanted systems, porous materials and deposited, embedded or stacked semiconductor nanostructures. So you can see the tremendous implication that GSAX offers uh, for characterization not only pertaining to semiconductor uh, materials characterization, but also for surface related issues like surface chemistry as well as catalysis. Another important aspect that has been uh, uh, investigated extensively using GSACs has been quantum dots, which have been obtained by state of the art processing techniques like molecular beam epitaxy and liquid beam epitaxy. The most important part and the biggest advantage that GSACs offers is that we can really monitor the evolution of size, shape and morphology as well as the distribution on the plane uh, uh, a 2D uh, distribution while the deposition is occurring. So this way it offers us a tool to constantly monitor the evolution of these, uh, these nanoscopic structures and the ability to play with the processing parameters or rather the deposition parameters to control the size, shape and morphology of the quantum uh, or rather the nanoscopic entities to be processed. So not only do, uh, does GSACs provide information about the morphology, it also gives us information about the structure of the material. We won't be talking much about the structure part, but uh, I am just trying to touch upon this aspect just to know, let you know that GSACs can give us some information about the chemical structure as well as uh, the morphological uh, structure of the material. It gives us uh, information in the same length scale as that of SACs ranging from about 10 to 1000 angstrom. In addition, it can give us information about in plane 
since grazing incidence x-ray uh, small angle x-ray scattering essentially is a surface characterization technique it gives us information not only in the plane but also out of the plane or normal to the plane which is very very important for doing what is known as x-ray reflectivity and like I had already mentioned in the last class small angle x-ray scattering is uh, complementary to say characterization techniques like SEM, TEM and atomic force microscopy. Similarly, GSACS is also complementary to something like uh, SEM and uh, atomic force microscopy. At the same time as we discussed in the last uh, course uh, or the last slide, we figure out that GSACS is absolutely essential and absolutely state of the art when it comes to studying in situ uh, studies on deposition of uh, various materials. The best part about uh, GSACS is that simply by wearing the probe depth, the depth uh, uh, to which the X-rays are penetrating, we can study subsurface information. Uh, we can obtain significantly important subsurface information using GSACS. This is particularly important for studying subsurface damage caused during say something like implantation. The other than important aspect which is very important, uh, which is very uh, peculiar to GSACS is the ability to, to study in situ deposition and catalysis. At the same time, like we had discussed in the last class that small angle X-ray scattering also provides us if not directly in an indirect way the chemical contrast between uh, different uh, phases. We can also use GSACS and separate out chemically, uh, chemically uh, distinct entities in GSACS. However, having said that, I hope you appreciate that in grazing incidence small angle scat uh, x-ray scattering, the entire diffraction is occurring from a very very small volume of material. And since the volume of material is very very small, the kind of intensity that we are going to get is also going to be very very low. And therefore, we need a synchrotron source which gives us very high brilliance and intensity to obtain good amount of data using grazing incidence small angle x-ray scattering. In the last class, we had discussed that for small angle scattering, a synchrotron is essentially uh, good. Uh, but however, you can alway, uh, always do small angle x-ray scattering using say a rotating anode or a micro focus tube. However, in order to do grazing incidence small angle scattering, it is almost always better to use a synchrotron source as the result op results obtained will be of high fidelity using a synchrotron source. So let us first try to understand what exactly or how really it works out in case of grazing incidence diffraction. So let us look at the grazing incidence geometry first. So if you look at the grazing incidence geometry, here I have shown a thin film deposited over a substrate. Here you can see I have kind of exaggerated this incident angle say theta i and you can see how the incident beam on the substrate gets diffracted. At the same time since it is uh, incident on the sample at a very small angle we do get a diffuse scattering or due to specular reflection and this is if you can imagine it is going mostly perpendicular or at an angle away from the substrate plane. At the same time, we also have a refracted beam which is going over here. Now I hope you appreciate depending on the incident angle, we can have various situations. This is what is depicted in the next slide. Herein, it is shown that for a uh, angle theta, incident angle theta, which is less than a particular critical value which will be described in the next uh, graph or next uh, image, you see uh, there is no refracted beam. At the same time, there is no uh, beam along the surface. So there is just an incident beam which just bounces off from the surface of the substrate. So this, at, this is what happens below the critical limit which is the theta critical or theta c in case of, a, of any substrate or any material. However, when you increase the theta incident which is over here, you see that at a particular angle you do get a uh, diffracted or reflected beam. But in addition to that, you get another refracted beam which just travels parallel to the surface of the substrate. So this, the angle at which this particular phenomena occurs is known as the critical angle. This essentially ensures that if your theta is less than theta c, you do not get any beam that gets refracted. However, at theta equal to theta c, you do get a condition where you, your beam does not get refracted, but in fact it runs parallel to the 
substrate surface. Now you can imagine that if you are at theta equal to theta c, you are going to get some information of the surface, what all you are having on the surface. At the same time, when you have an angle which is more than theta, uh, uh, which is more than the critical angle, you do see that you do get a refracted beam also. So now you can imagine by just that, by just changing the incident angle, we can get a lot of information uh, from the uh, substrate. Imagine now, let us go to the previous slide and look at a realistic situation wherein we not only have a substrate, but also we have a thin film or say something like a quantum dots, different morphology or say nanoparticles which are deposited on the surface of this substrate. So you can imagine that by choosing a proper combination uh, or rather a proper value of theta, we can get different conditions and obtain a lot of information which is pertaining to within the surface or normal to the surface or subsurface uh, in grazing incidence geometry. Now this particular point is exploited extensively while uh, doing uh, grazing incidence small angle x-ray scattering. So in this figure we have shown how exactly a thin film is uh, uh, deposited on a substrate and how when a high intensity x-ray is incident at, an, at a particular angle say alpha i, it gets reflected uh, at a particular angle alpha f which is not shown over here, but we will have a look at it later and there is another angle omega which is uh, or rather xi in which there is in plane uh, diffraction or rather in, uh, in plane, yeah in plane diffraction. So you can see that there is one uh, condition where there is out of plane and in the other case there is uh, diffraction within the plane which is along the direction parallel to the surface of the uh, substrate and therefore the scattering vector is given by q parallel while the normal vector, the scattering vector in the direction normal to the substrate uh, uh, plane is given by qz. Now how do we choose a critical angle for doing uh, grazing incidence small angle x-ray scattering on a film deposit on a substrate. So I hope you appreciate that we can have two critical angles over here, one for your film or a nanoscopic particles that are deposited on the surface and other for the substrate itself. So we choose depending on what kind of information we need. Obviously we are more interested when uh, we are studying uh, say a thin film or the nanoscopic deposited particles, we are more interested in the in these particles and therefore we want all the information, the diffraction information from these particles. So we want that we do get some information from, uh, we get maximum information from these particles. Therefore I hope you appreciate that when theta has to be greater than the theta critical from uh, theta critical of the particles or of the thin film. Now this is very essential to ensure that my x-rays get refracted. Let us go back to the previous slide and have a look. So if my film, if my theta is greater than theta c of the particles, this will ensure that my x-ray is passing through the particle and this can give me a lot of information about the structure as well as morphology of the particles, however, or thin film for that matter. However, if my theta c is higher than that of the theta critical for substrate, then my information what I am getting for the nanoscopic part, uh, nanoscopic entity, either a thin film or a particle will also contain some information uh, of the due to substrate refraction. This is something that I want to avoid since my area of interest is only the nanoscopic film or the particles. Therefore, I have to choose a critical angle for my thin film or nano, uh, nanoparticle on a substrate assembly such that the angle lies in between the theta critical of the substrate and that of the film, okay. So that I get some signal from the or rather most of my signal is coming from the thin film as well as I get some signal from uh, the substrate but it, there is no refraction occurring in the substrate. Now this is also very very important if at all say I am doing implantation studies. You know what happens during implantation? During implantation we have heavy uh, metal ions or heavy ions uh, colliding with uh, 
a surf uh, with the substrate. So, you can imagine that there will be a lot of damage caused in the substrate depending on the energy of the ions and this damage can vary depending on the depth right the distance from the surface. So, if you want to study the subsurface damage that is occurring uh, due to implantation you can always play with the incident angle the theta. So, that we get information from different depths. So, this is one parameter which is used routinely to control the information the extent of information that we are getting during grazing incidents small angle x-ray scattering. So, the entity that I was showing like how exactly it looks. So, this time around I have drawn a set of a bunch of rather small nanoparticles on a substrate. So, we have the beam incident at alpha i and the wave vector corresponding to it at k i. This gets uh, scattered at k f the, uh, the scattering vector is k f while the angle here is alpha f at the same time this is normal the scattering here is out of the plane. At the same time there is going to be some scattering which is going to be in plane and this is do, uh, shown over here which corresponds to uh, this uh, scattering vector q y and angle of 2 theta f right. So, we have these two scattering vectors q z and q y one out of the plane and q y which is in the plane right. So, we get information all the information related. So, you know that q y and q z will be in the reciprocal space right, but q y will contain all the information corresponding to what is happening in the two dimensions while q z or q z will consider all the information uh, in the reciprocal space in the direction normal to the surface of the substrate. So, I have again another uh, schematic which is shown over here borrowed from a very nice uh, review paper which I have extensively followed uh, by renowned uh, et al. So, this shows essentially the realistic uh, picture of what exactly is happening during GSAC. So, you have the incident beam and you see all these nanoscopic things means we are really talking about very small dimensions it means GSAC is used to essentially probe very very small dimensions of the order of few nanometers. Uh, so, the structure is essentially similar to like this and this essentially shows what kind of uh, events that you can exp, uh, expect during GSACs and what kind of signals that you can get. Here again it is shown you can see that this sample rotation is provided about omega just to improve the statistics and this is how and we can have note down the value over here note down the pattern the scattering pattern as a function of omega. Okay, so, let us now go into and understand try to just touch upon the physics of uh, grazing incidence uh, small angle x-ray scattering. Uh, well, uh, I would all, uh, uh, like to mention that it is a pretty involved subject and I am not going to touch upon all the details of uh, you know the scattering or diffraction theory associated with grazing incidence small angle x-ray scattering. But what we are going to try and do is just to get a feel for things and see how the kind of knowledge that we have gained while deriving structure factor. Uh, for normal diffraction as well as we derived what are known as the form factors right in the last class how these can be extended to understand how does grazing incidence small angle x-ray scattering works. So, you know that incident x-rays are at alpha i are scattered along k f in the direction 2 theta f and alpha f right like if you go back to the previous slide you see that you know there is this k f and there is 2 theta f which is uh, k f in the direction theta uh, alpha f and which is out of the plane as well as in the plane it is uh, reflected at 2 theta f right. So, this is what is given over here. You can always define a corresponding scattering wave vector using the geometry as q x y z 2 pi by lambda and this particular matrix. Remember this is in 3 d. Now, if you remember in small angle x-ray scattering we also had a term which was uh, q, uh, q what we got was 4 pi by lambda and there was a sin theta term if I remember it correctly. Now, you I hope you appreciate that we talked about this in small angle x-ray scattering right like the angles we are talking about are going to be very very small and since the angles are going to be very very small in order to detect uh, these very small angles the sample to the detector distance has to be very very large. Therefore, we looked that you know even in small angle x-ray scattering this distance was as large as 1 meter. Now, when we are talking about the grazing incident scattering the same rule applies and we have a sample detector distance as large as 1 to 4 meters. So, this is quite huge. However, 
if you go to even what is known as grazing incidence, ultra small angle x-ray scattering where the diffraction occurs are at very, very small angle less than certainly 1 degree, you see the distance can be as large as 1 to 12 meters. But this is only possible uh, or rather only used when we are using a synchrotron light source. So, you know that the scattering intensity in the lateral direction what all uh, intensity that we are getting can be given is i q and this i q is related to the form factor f which is nothing but which tell carries the information of the shape of the sample in the reciprocal space and your s q which is known as the interference function. This in fact is very similar to, uh, uh, to what is what we studied uh, what is known as structure factor. Now, this I hope you appreciate and understand that here we are talking only about 2D structures. So, what all structures we have in 2D, they can have lead to a particular structure factor. Like we have for simple say FCC or BCC, you can do that. And in fact, we will be going through one example over there. But the most important point is, so our SQ carries the information about the spatial distribution, right, while the F carries the information about the shape of the uh, particles right so the actual intensity that we are getting is a combination of these two and we know that this we had studied in the last uh, class itself that the shape function what we are having so we can derive shape functions take the fourier transform because remember what all in the real uh, space what we are having the uh, the particle or your yeah the particle uh, or quantum dot for that matter is going to have a size, shape and morphology in real space. However, you have to uh, appreciate that the entire information is has to be mapped into the reciprocal space and therefore, you uh, we had studied that you know your reciprocal space is nothing but a Fourier transform of the real space, right. So, all this shape, size and uh, morphology are going to be modulated in a particular way to obtain a particular Fourier transform. So, the size, shape uh, and morphology that we see in the real space is, it is will be uh, if you take a Fourier transform of this uh, size, shape you can get a corresponding uh, Fourier transform which corresponds to a particular uh, size, shape of the particle in the reciprocal space. At the same time when we talk about all these simple transformations you have to keep one thing in mind that one thing which you had taken for granted was that all this involved scattering only once and that too kinematic scattering. So, this is what is known as a Porth approximation. However, I hope you appreciate that in G sax geometry the Porth approximation may not hold true. Now, let me just go back and tell you what exactly is Born approximation. So, if you look at this particular image, you, you can see that you know you just have one condition. So, there is one scattering right from one of these blocks or one of these uh, dots of atoms or a cluster of atoms which we see over here. It can be a quantum dot or a nanoparticle. However, this is not the only case that can be expected. Like we can have a case wherein uh, let us assume that if you are incident at a different angle, you get first reflected from the surface and then you bounce off and you go through this uh, particle, right. Th th there is a distinct probability of this happening. Let me just go and uh, show you what exactly I mean. So, let if we go to the surface and we have say something like a pillar over here, in case of Born approximation we know that you know there is only single scattering, while you know that in this kind of a case that is not necessarily true. So, we can have a situation where your incident x-ray first gets reflected from the substrate and then it gets scattered, right. And I hope you appreciate that there can be a plenty of other options that can happen, right? Like it can go like this, get reflected, uh, okay, or rather, go to, okay, I, I will just like to rub this off. I have made a mistake here, okay. So, let us go back and have a look what exactly can happen in this geometry. So, this is something uh, what we are having. So, this is a substrate, right, and say this is my something like a quantum dot. So, the Born approximation essentially talks about single scattering event, right, single kinematic scattering. Uh, 
However, in this case, I hope you appreciate that we can have a situation where the beam gets first reflected right from the substrate and then it gets scattered or it can get scattered through this one right through your substrate and then again get reflected right. So, all these multiple scattering events can occur in the grazing incidence geometry. Therefore, we do not uh, it is generally understood that this normal Born approximation of single scattering is not at all uh, valid and instead we do get uh, different scattering events that lead to different scattering cross section and therefore, there is a need to account for all this in the calculation. Now, this is very complicated and I am not going to touch upon it, but this is what is known as or these corrections considering all these uh, events is, uh, uh, is accounted for in what is known as diffracted wave Born approximation and it includes entire uh, uh, examples or entire category of reflection and refraction events that can be uh, that can occur during grazing incidence small angle x-ray scattering. Right. So, let us again go back and look at the geometry. So, I, am, I see all the angles what we are talk, talking about are pretty small the alpha i, alpha c or alpha f are pretty small, but just for the sake of simplicity I have kind of blown them up so that we can appreciate it. So, you can imagine that what actually is happening again the same image that your sample incident uh, the x-rays are incident uh, the wave vector k f it is incident at uh, k i rather incident at an angle alpha i. So, what we see is there is a specular peak right. Now, the specular peak as I hope you appreciate gives you a lot of information in the this is all along z right. So, this is q z and this alpha f that you see that is along q y. So, this gives you information about the in plane information right in the reciprocal space while q z gives you out of plane right. So, you get what is known as the specular peak. Now, this specular peak gives you the information which is normal to the sub, uh, surface of the substrate right or film. Therefore, it can give you information and specular as the name suggests uh, can give you information about say something like the thickness of the film right like and this is classically known as x-ray reflectivity. While the second peak that you get is essentially what is known as the Yoneda peak which gives you the maximum scattering in the z direction. Now, talking about uh, specular peak I hope uh, you appreciate that uh, in the form factors calculation we had seen that how we get a uh, lot of uh, bumps right like you get first a valley let me just go and draw it. Right. So, this is something what we had got earlier. So, this was i versus q and this was correlated with the size of the particle in our small angle x-ray scattering. Similarly, we can use the specular peak that we are getting to measure say something like the period right if you are having thin film like what is the thickness of individual film. So, that information can be obtained using a specular peak I will talk about in details in the next slide, but what I want to uh, want you to remember is that the specular as well as the Yoneda peak ok which occur uh, which show diffraction in the z direction gives you a lot of information about in, in a direction perpendicular to the uh, uh, substrate of the film. Okay. So, in these specular peak there is no information on the lateral surface there is only information for a di uh, along the direction perpendicular to the plane of the substrate and it is best to measure the average thickness of all the particles of uh, 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 average thickness of the film uh, that we are having and this gives rise to a technique known as x-ray reflectivity. However, I hope you appreciate that if you are interested only in obtaining information perpendicular to the direction or perpendicular to the uh, plane of the substrate you do not really want any information about the uh, plane of the surface and therefore, the plane of the substrate and therefore, to obtain very good x-ray reflectivity data you have to ensure that there is no scattering in this direction and this gives rise to a particular condition wherein you have 2 theta f equal to 0. So, essentially this is achieved using this figure shows a very nice way wherein you increase alpha and, and alpha f right symmetrically to probe the reciprocal space perpendicular to the surface and while doing that you have to ensure that your 2 theta f is actually 0 
so that all the information that we are getting is only along the z. And this uh, is very important because the interference, now why do we get all these speckle pattern that I showed you? This is due to interference between layer and substrate or if there are multi layer film, you get interference between different layers or layer and vacuum if there is only one layer. And this gives rise to interference pattern like we have, we get uh, during say a Young's double slit experiment and this leads to a maxima and minima and this interference pattern can be used again remember what information we are getting is in reciprocal space. But once we convert it to real space, we do get information about say thickness of the film. So these are known as casing fringes and this gives us information about the layer thickness. Having said that not only for you know very homogeneous you know thickness uh, or homogeneous films and we can determine thickness, we can also use using uh, a lot of uh, assumptions. Uh, X-ray reflectivity to analyze roughness as well as interdiffusion profiles in various uh, interfaces. So, a schemat or uh, rather a experimental result of g sachs pattern of the, the cobalt 0.6 nanometer on silica 4.3 nanometer uh, 60 such uh, layers uh, discontinuous multi layers shows it's, it's, you see it shows q y equal to 0, here is q y, but you see your q z, you see nice Bragg diffraction peaks corresponding to cobalt. So, you can uh, imagine that how you can use, so I am not showing the analysis part over here, but using this, uh, you see this is in the reciprocal space, so this will be uh, say something like nanometer inverse. So, using this we can actually find out what is the period of the film. Okay. So, now let us go and have a look at the instrumentation part. Up till now when we talked about instrumentation of x-rays, I hope you know what all is needed. But having said that, you uh, one thing that needs to be remembered as I had already mentioned is that for grazing incident small angle x-ray scattering, almost always a synchrotron is uh, needed. And therefore, I am showing a schematic of the grazing incidence small angle x-ray facility with ultra high vacuum chamber at BM32 beam line at the European synchrotron radiation facility. So, why do we have a ultra high vacuum chamber? Well, to utilize grazing incident small angle uh, scattering to its optimum. Now, a ultra high vacuum chamber uh, actually ensures that we can do a lot of thin film deposition and that is what is shown over here. So, you can do a lot of deposition sources right and study the evolution of these nano structure will be it nano film or say quantum dots in situ and really observe how they are growing, uh, 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 how they are growing in vacuum. So, this assembly essentially shows that from a synchrotron we get a nice coherent parallel ray of beam which is incident on your sample and you see over here we have a beam stopper because you know if there is a direct incident beam we, it can cause damage to our detector and you can see the g sachs detector is placed right at very small angle to the incident uh, to with respect to the sample. And you see over here, here we have this normal grazing incidence x-ray diffraction which is at a slightly angle, uh, at a slightly higher angle. But you see the incidence over here for your grazing incidence small angle x-ray scattering is pretty small and this can be uh, uh, figured out as you see they are almost in the, they are not in the same line, but they make a very, very small angle with the sample, right. So, this shows another uh, the same thing in a different assembly. Again note the distance, the distance between your sample and the detector is huge and there is a, there should be a beryllium window over here so that your x-rays can pass and here you see there is almost normal, you see how small the angle is right and you see here you get all the information, in plane information over here straight away on your 2D detector while out of plane information is over here q perpendicular right. This is where you will get your specular pattern and your Yoneda peak. So, again I am mentioning time and again that all these information, these are all exaggerated figures, you know, these are all happening at a nanoscopic level and see this angle is very, very small, very, very small and that is why, that is the reason essentially why we keep this distance very, very large, right, so that we are able to see some difference, okay. So, I hope you appreciate what all is the overall structure of a grazing incidence small angle x-ray scattering system and therefore, these are not available in laboratories and are uh, available on uh, at various beam lines in a synchrotron source. So, how do they look like? We talked about form factors and all, 
uh, form factors as well as the interference uh, factor right the inter uh, uh, the interference pattern right so it was rather in uh, let's go back and have a look so this is your interference function right so we have form factor and we have interference function so let us see now how actually they coincide right like this we had seen in case of small angles x ray scattering that if the form factor is different how do we see uh, different uh, diffraction uh, rather a different uh, scattering pattern here in addition to the different scattering pattern we also get information about how those different particles or uh, uh, yeah those different con uh, dots are assembled in uh, a 2D uh, in, in, in uh, along the 2D substrate. So, this is uh, how what we will try to understand. So, the form factor stuff we know that if you have a particular shape in real space how it can get transformed into the reciprocal space. So, this is just a simple Fourier transform of the shape under consideration. So, here if we look the in the first figure we see that if we have one a cylindrical shape we do get a particular pattern. Now, I would like to mention that this takes into account the diffracted wave Born approximation right diffracted wave Born approximation which accounted uh, for different reflection and refraction conditions. So, this uh, uh, diffracted wave uh, Born approximation ensures that you know this is the kind of pattern that we get. Now, you know that if we are getting this kind of a pattern a particular kind of pattern this can be correlated with the shape of the particle right and you see there is a bit of periodicity. Now, this periodicity comes in the reciprocal space because of various uh, multiple uh, scattering events right. Now, if we go and have a spherical shape you do see that we get a completely different kind of pattern. So, see depending on the two shapes right a cylindrical versus a spherical we can get different uh, form factors right in the reciprocal space. The same case or similar case is shown for a half sphere as well as for a uh, for, for a prism. So, here you can see how different uh, it looks and depending on this particular uh, form factor we can find out what is the shape of the particles. At the same time I talked about right like how we are keeping uh, the material or uh, the nanoparticles in 2D can give rise to what is known as the interference function. So, therefore, if you look at a simple hexagonal uh, structure of say particles uh, that uh, that means in other words uh, the, if the particles are arranged forming a hexagonal lattice we get the uh, the variation uh, in uh, uh, along say something like your uh, alpha f and 2 theta f in this pattern. So, you, you do get these fringes. Now, these fringes that we are getting have a particular periodicity because of the hexagonal structure. Now, the actual scattering pattern that we are going to get has is going to be the superposition of this uh, interference function and the form factor right. Like we had this equation f, uh, f of q y q z square into s right that was your scattering intensity. So, this is where you see. So, if, we, if I have a hexagonal arrangement of my spherical patterns well I do get a pattern which corresponded to my spherical form factor right like which we had derived over here. So, here we have a spherical form factor, but the way it is arranged the lattice is hexagonal. So, therefore, there is a superposition of these two things and we do get a very different pattern right. So, now this form factor I hope you appreciate that once you get your experimental pattern what we need to do is we need to assume shapes or make a first guess do simulations and get a good match between the experimental and simulated pattern to comment something about the size and shape of the particle. Similar in uh, you know information or similar patterns for now can we try to guess more what exactly we are getting. So, I hope you appreciate that we are getting the same period or rather yeah it is the same period. So, this has to be all hexagonal. Now, if you look at this one now this to me looks like. So, this is what this is superposition of half sphere with the hexagonal one while this is superposition of half sphere uh, uh, the superposition of a prism uh, with the hexagonal lattice. So, therefore, I hope you appreciate that for the last two uh, scattering patterns particularly for the uh, 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 with and uh, we are having a hexagonal arrangement. However, of uh, particles however, for the first uh, uh, case we are having a half sphere party or rather a half sphere sitting at all the corners of the hexagon while 
for the second case which is shown over here we have a prism sitting at all the corners of the hexagon. So, here again I have chosen one particular example uh, and uh, try to show you how exactly we can see in situ growth of particles. So, here again we are having the growth of germanium on silicon 001 uh, substrate. Right. So, here you see that as the sample uh, or as the uh, quantum uh, dot is growing, we do see that there is a change in the scattering pattern and also all these uh, things can be confirmed by doing say AFM or scanning electron microscopy. So, we can see that with the uh, deposition condition, we can look at uh, how the uh, you know uh, how the quantum dot is evolving in shape as well as size. Now, I would like to emphasize that you know for carrying out SCM and all, it is very difficult. You cannot do it. We have to stop at each and every stage and then do the sample. However, grazing incident small angle X-ray scattering probably offers the only technique wherein you can monitor you know the evolution of a particular uh, you know the growth of particles or catalysis or uh, chemical reactions occurring at the surface in situ right. So, this is the only technique that gives you real in situ information. Okay. So, to summarize I hope you appreciate that uh, grazing incidence small angle x-ray scattering technique is now well established to characterize morphology of nanoscopic and to a certain extent microscopic particles. For microscopic particles we essentially do not uh, really need grazing incidence small angle x-ray scattering, but for nanoscopic particles this is probably the only technique to give you a lot of information while doing in situ experiments. We get complete information about nanoparticle sizes, shapes, distribution, faceting as well as spatial correlation. However, I would like to point out that this information is not a, you know a straightforward information. Like diffraction all the information that we are getting is in the diffracted uh, space and there, uh, that is that corresponds to the Fourier space right. The best uh, possibility of GSACs is the in situ studies. They offer an excellent platform to study growth, catalysis and self organization. Having said that synchrotron radiation is almost necessary. I will make a very strong statement and say that uh, you know uh, synchrotron radiation is necessary for doing good quality grazing incidence small angle x-ray scattering. And having done grazing incidence small angle x-ray scattering, it is always a good idea to confirm your results with say other techniques like scanning electron microscopy uh, or scanning tunneling microscopy or AFM. Having said that grazing incidence small angle x-ray scattering though not available uh, routinely offers a very sophisticated tool to study the structure of materials at the nanoscopic scale. Thank you.